and welcome to these conversations on curating art practice and writing in times of isolation and social distancing. I'm Paul Stewart and I'll be chairing a series of conversations with different artists and curators around these ideas. Hope you enjoy and welcome to Homework. So uh, luckily today we have Barry Sharpsky, who is an art critic for The Nation and co-editor of Reviews for Art Forum, uh, who is also co-written, uh, has sorry, has written the text uh, that we're reading today within the book The Perpetual Guest. Um, so Barry's going to give us some ideas and thoughts through that book, um, but also an opportunity for us to further discuss some specific ideas around the complexities of arts education and its permissions to fail. So, hello, Barry. Hello, Paul. <laughs> hello. Um, <laughs> so, the reason why uh, we're reading this book in class is I feel that it's a perfect example of different ways of approaching art practice through writing. Um, it's also your writing style that's really important, I think, to the delivery within a studio-based course because it's reflective, it's got a good rapport, and it's accessible within like a practical visual mind. It's really helpful. Um, and the reason why I've decided to wrap up the class with the permission to fail chapter is because of something that you said within it and what I've learned from you whilst at the European Graduate School in the Sasfe Summer Institute of Art, which was that within our arts education, it's the only place where you pulled the rug from underneath your feet, <laughs> as, uh, as you've said before, to re-look at something on a constant basis but kind of unnerving your own footing in some way. Um, I wondered if you could talk a bit about that experience within your own uh, background of education um, and what you think is really specific to an arts experience of education. Well maybe this became a uh vivid to me because of the fact that I'm not really a full-time or steady participant in education, but I'm someone who goes in and out of it. And so every time I go back into it, I kind of uh, myself get pulled up short by being reminded of how different it can be from uh, a lot of other things that I see in, in, in society. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a rare thing where, uh, at periodically, a kind of self, uh, maybe not self undermining, maybe that's going too far, but <laughs> sidestepping yourself, uh, so often shows itself as a healthy and helpful way of proceeding. And, uh, yeah, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's how, uh, you know, doctors are trained or, uh, <laughs> or, uh, engineers or, or so on. So, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite unusual in that way, I think. Mm. So you think, you know, that sidestepping experience, do you think that means that, there is maybe do, what that experience from having an art school education and now applying it to uh, lots of students and artists alike and now having to work out how to make their work from complete isolation away from materials, facilities, workshops, peer groups, their own studio. Um, do you think that there has a certain toolbox that makes artists maybe and writers well, more critical practitioners really rather than just artists? anyone working in that sector um, have the ability to adapt in a different way whilst trying to make work at, at home or in wherever they're isolated yeah I mean I think uh, you know it's just it's a question of um, one's relationship to one's materials in a certain way and including 
a studio or whatever as one of the materials mm. uh, that you work with. And I think that no artist ever really works in isolation because their materials and their tools and so on all come to them from outside, from other people. And uh, sometimes a tool that you got used to and you like to work with, you might not be able to, you know, it might have worn out and you might not be able to replace it. And then you think, uh oh, I have to shift my practice somehow in such a way as to accommodate for the fact that this thing I've kind of grown dependent on is no longer available mm -hmm. to me. So, uh, you know, this is certainly a much more sudden and wholesale. Uh, <laughs> Uh, change along those lines, but it's still a, a, a difference of degree from, yeah, you know, uh, like my wife, who's an artist for years, mm. she was always working with a certain kind of uh, pencil, you know, mm. that she liked to use for her drawings. And the company that made the pencil somehow changed it or stopped making it, mm. or I, maybe they continued to make something that's looked like it was going to be the same one, but actually was made differently and didn't do certain things that she was oh. used to. And yes. for a while, she kind of went around buying up all the old ones that she could find in different places, but eventually <laughs> they were gone and she had to come up with, you know, a different way to draw. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she did. Uh, yeah. But, you know, that the very fact that you, you know, you, you want as a practitioner of any art to get to a place where you have things that you feel mm. comfortable with and you you can see that you have uh you have a long way in front of you where you can just mm. develop a thought develop a practice and go deeper and deeper into it and have all the changes that occur in it kind of come from you inside mm. in a way but then periodically you always get i think to a place where actually uh something imposes itself on you from outside and you have to respond to it. And, um, you know, there's a certain kind of resilience mm. that's necessary in order to, yeah, to kind of roll with the punches when that and say, okay, well, uh, I can't do that. I'll try this. Yes. I think that's something, yeah, that's a really interesting way of, of putting it. And I think um, when reading over the chapter, Permission to Fail, that you've kind of focused on around this idea of the education, you know, the complexity of arts education, maybe more specifically, you kind of mentioned about the fragmentation of art education. Mm -hmm. And maybe actually that kind of example of your wife's pencil in the same way that um, very different circumstances maybe to the COVID-19 isolation, but actually very similar in terms of trying to adapt practice and meaning, yeah. realizing that maybe there's there's something within our ways of reflecting um, and art school education that we need to think clearly about those fragments and how they make up one whole. I mean, not too dissimilar to the works that I can see above your head in the video, um, <laughs> you know, the, the multiple fragments yeah. that are present. Uh -huh. that actually each of them have their own importance, but as a whole, they make up the work maybe yeah. in some way. I don't know, maybe that's, is that what you're trying to get to with this kind of, this ref really, I think this chapter is really nice in in the Perpetual Guest because it's really reflective. It's a moment that kind of lets you into the author in a different way. Well, look, I think that in a way, uh, and this is just something I was thinking about this morning when I, I reread the essay in order to mm. be ready to <laughs> And uh, it sort of struck me that you could say about school uh, the same thing that you could say about the family, for instance, mm. which is uh, that it can be one of the most horrible, oppressive, negative institutions mm. <laughs> uh, that exists and it can also be one of the more nourishing and nurturing and uh, enabling yeah. uh, and sometimes sometimes it's both yes uh, and uh, you know that somehow we we 
yeah, we have to be sort of available both to to being very critical toward it and also being appreciative of some of the things that are possible through mm. it. Yes, definitely. And I think I think what's really clear in in what you've put into this into this essay of starting with that reflective process of you know from your experience of this girlfriend who was an artist mm-hmm. um really thinking about that idea of a relationship to someone in a mm-hmm. way that you wait the way that you're kind of talking about art school as family mm-hmm. that it has this moment that can be um happy and then there can also be pain mm-hmm. and i think you know i i do hope that all students at universities have more of the positive <laughs> experience <laughs> than the negative but you're completely right that that seeing the art school family is as similar to a, a blood family is mm-hmm. is a really interesting relationship and maybe that kind of plays on the way that you wrap up that chapter when you mention about um uh, mike kelly mm-hmm. uh, and talk about the way that mike kelly was it uh, let me just find it here where it said some artists of jacot and roncier think that they see a way out kelly makes us feel that we need one <laughs> which i think is a really I like I like the way that you're kind of pushing on this idea that uh, of this need rather than an expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, what made you come to that conclusion of using the term need more specifically? Well, uh, I think it was it was <laughs> seeing uh, Mike Kelly's retrospective back then mm-hmm. uh, after you know after his death and. Um, uh, you know, and really being very aware of his uh, his his anguish, you know, mm. and uh, the real emotional uh, demand, in a sense, mm. that even more than need uh, that the work seemed to give body to that. Um, he was looking at his life and particularly his relation to institutions mm. in his life and uh, and being very aware of this sense of being having been betrayed by them in many ways and uh, without necessarily thinking that it could be any different, thinking that it has to be different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think I think I do like the fact that you're that the way you're moving with it in terms of a demand, that there's not not even just a need, there's a it's a necessity yeah. for this idea of of, of of the need of one, of this mm-hmm. this change of this kind of stulsifying relationship to education, this moment of being able to reform and see maybe not just the art school but that process of learning to be an artist is a constant process of becoming um and that's something that I I very much believe in and and I feel that I've witnessed from my experience of uh of both the SASFE Summer Institute of Art twice in both uh SASFE the first time and in Berlin the second time and I imagine its reiterations have been equally as successful uh chaotic and uh, entertaining um, from those kind of um, intense learning environments but I think within this text what I really feel is really important as well that's sort of coming across is this kind of moment of where the artist's role to some extent might be to dismiss their own education and I don't mean that in like a negative way um, to to say that it was of not of no worth but to yeah to refresh and relook at that process and go right i that's the way that i learned this is not the way that i will teach mm-hmm. and to rehash that in some way that might be that kind of you know that reference to what you mentioned about pulling a rug from under your feet mm-hmm. might be more into it in the sense that a doctor trains to be a doctor and they then will teach a doctor to be a doctor mm-hmm. but for an artist to teach an artist they then teach the next generation of artists everything that they feel is different to how they were taught to be an artist there's no it's a really well, bizarre in, in, relationship of course in that sense it's also up to the students who know mm. something about how things are different that the teacher doesn't know yet mm. and just on a really simple 
level. I remember a long time ago reading an, uh, an interview with Gerhard Richter, mm. and he said, well, uh, you know, I was taught to paint by, uh, you know, having the teacher set up a still life and having us paint it and so on. And so when I started to teach, I did the same thing. And then after 1968, the students refused to paint a still life. So, <laughs> so, I, had to, so I had to think of something else. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's really interesting. I'm trying to think of moments that I've had where students have refused to to do something, and I don't think I've I've had that. Maybe because obviously since '68 we've had such a shift in the way that we approach material. Yeah. Um, if anything, the students are calling or harking for more traditional methods of learning. You know, mm. they're wanting to learn how to paint and draw in a way that when I was at art school I would have detested. I would have refused to have learnt in that way. And I wonder if it's trying to understand oneself in a very complex world at the minute of instant messaging of direct satisfaction of trying to place skill within relationship to to knowledge yeah. which might be quite particular more to you know shifts in western democracies in the uk and the us of trying to place value in oneself's practice with the rise of right-wing populism possibly mm. but i think that that's a really amazing anecdote there of, of gerhard richter just setting up I love this image of him setting up a still life and then students just refusing to do it yeah it's brilliant oh I mean this moment now of trying to think about how to teach uh, art schools and and especially studio sessions mm -hmm. it's making me think a bit a bit of what Berthold Brecht was talking about in terms of the interval maybe where the actors stop acting and the spectators stop spectating that they just become people again, that there's this, this moment where there's a removal of the role mm -hmm. that we are in that moment. And, and I feel very much that I'm in a role of where I'm no longer acting as a teacher okay. because I'm about to approach a way of teaching that I, I have no experience of doing. <laughs> I have no experience of understanding how to talk about practice or studio teaching without students having studio work. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, uh, for me, that's where I kind of, that's where I feel. And I think that when I'm looking over this text, which I feel is so apt, I don't know how it's ended up that it's this week that I've picked this text for the students to look at, but I feel I am learning more from the text of reminding myself that it's okay to fail and it's okay not to know because of the nature of the permissions that are available within an art education. I think it also has to be, you know, reconsidered what's a studio and, mm. uh, you know, why any space that you have mm. to work in shouldn't be mm. that, uh, if necessary. And I, uh, I think even about a painter like Morris Lewis and, uh, I was so shocked when I found out that uh, he, you know, those paintings he made in a, in a room of this little uh, house that he shared with his wife in, I think, the suburbs of Washington, mm. D.C., and uh, the room was actually uh, of a smaller dimension than the paintings. So. <laughs> He could make them, but he never actually saw them until that he would have a show, and then he could send them out to be stretched somewhere else, and he would see them on the wall in the in the gallery. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, those you know famously optical mm. paintings were kind of made blind, mm -hmm. uh, and I find that really, I don't know, there's something emblematic there. Yeah, definitely. Maybe that's the way that the students should be approaching the situation is that the studio isn't uh, four white walls and a grey floor in a similar way that we would consider a white cube gallery space. But we need to think a studio is a place of, of making. Yeah. And at this point, it's really important to make. And thinking about, like, I even like the way that you're saying that, you know, that the work would leave the studio and then would never be realised until the display. Mm -hmm. I think that's <laughs> that could be a way of thinking about how we get the work from these new 
forms of like a post studio environment in the home mm -hmm. into a shared digital platform or maybe it might be the I mean I was talking to Dorothy Richter um earlier as well and talking a bit about maybe a remote like a, a re-emergence of mail art within Fluxus you know maybe yeah. that's what we're, we should return to we should be posting each other books and things to respond to and make from Mm -hmm. And that could be the way, of, that could be the degree show. It could be yeah. to post the work, <laughs> post it, and each person gets to experience the degree show for one day before they post it onto someone else. It could be mm -hmm. that kind of experience. It could be really different. I mean, what what advice would you give, you know, artists or writers now in these kind of situations? Because I know we've talked about it a little bit, and we both kind of mentioned how difficult it is maybe to focus mm -hmm. um, on the work that we're making when surrounded by this siren of of fear really mm -hmm. of of sustainability of not just you know our own health but the economy of how it, what's it how how is it possible to to make when it feels like there could be no future uh what, yeah what? i don't know i mean i mean i'm not sure i'm not sure it is i mean i feel uh but uh, yeah it's very difficult mm -hmm. but um and as for myself, I could just say that uh, since this has begun, and it seems like it was so long ago, but actually it wasn't very long ago <laughs> at all, uh, I've almost been stopped in my tracks in terms of trying to get any critical writing done and uh, you know, trying to write a lecture that I, in, in some way, shape, or form, I'm going to have to give you know, before very long. Uh, and so on, and I, I find myself unable to do it. But uh, uh, but I'm writing some poetry just out of the sense that I don't know why, but just mm -hmm. uh, I I can't stop doing it. Mm -hmm. So um, but yeah, I mean, I, I in a certain sense, I'd really just like to be. Uh, laying in bed reading Victoria <laughs> yeah. for a few months or something yes. like that. Uh, but it's not going to happen either. I don't no. know. I don't know. It's really, uh, it's really a rough uh, moment and I don't think I can give any good mm. advice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the advice is that you're feeling like the, the ability, well, you're feeling that you can't stop writing these poems at the minute and sticking with that experience and just doing what your body needs both mentally and physically is really really important you know and i think there would be something quite amazing about just wrapping up with you know virginia wolf or and hiding in a in the corner of a bedroom to read orlando again would be a, a much better way of approaching this moment of crisis than it would be to work out how to work from home <laughs> which feels like a more stressful experience mm -hmm. I mean, with with the with the text, with the because now we've gone through a few of the chapters in the book, and we're coming to this this permission to fail, this final element. Is there a particular way that you would like it to be read, or for someone to tackle it? Would you want them to be reading it, seeing it from a um, a reflective point of view, a a more kind of humble, humorous? How would you see this chapter in its emotion? Oh. Uh, well, I, I, uh, that's an interesting question because I think, uh, of course, with any piece of writing that's not extraordinarily brief and pointed, mm. you know, it goes through different feelings as it mm. goes along. And so... Um, Therefore, it's sort of up to each reader to to see for themselves where where they think it ends up adding up to uh, in terms of a sort of emotional uh, equator, if that's the right word. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that also for myself reading it now would be different from what it would have felt like in the time 
of writing it. Um, you know, it's interesting because you had mentioned uh, the Thomas Hirschhorn article. I also mm. reread that, and then I was uh, thinking in a different way about the relationship between Hirschhorn's idea of headlessness and mm. You know, the ignorance that's uh, with Jacques Attay talked about in the Permission to Fail essay. And uh, I don't think those are the same idea, but, mm. but they're clearly related ideas. And then uh, in the essay in the same book about Jerry Durham, I point out how he recurrently uses words like silly mm. and how he uses it in regard to things that other people do that he's critical of, but he also uses it in relation to, to himself and his own activities. And he understands that this silliness is part of his own way of working and his particularly, like he says that, uh, oh, you know, I, I try and do everything that people ask me to do. And so therefore I find myself doing a lot of things uh, that are silly, but, but then I'm happy that I did them. And, um, you know, that idea that, again, that you're, you're sort of breaking your own boundaries mm -hmm. to accommodate a situation that comes to you from outside, uh, leads you astray but actually leading you astray might turn out to be a worth a thing worthwhile to have done mm. and uh so you know silly comes into this constellation too and um i guess i think I, I, my mind is a little bit wandering here but i i guess i think that when i look back on myself and my kind of time in uh, in my relation to art and I think about how when uh, I think when I came into the art world mm. uh, and for some time after there was there was really um, a, a kind of desire in many quarters for for the the idea of rigor you know mm. And uh, rigorousness was really something to be pointed out and praised and so on. And uh, I don't think I was ever comfortable with that mm. as, as, a, as a value, uh, even though, you know, I recognize the value of that value, but uh, I, I don't feel uh, like I want to own that. And um, so I think I've always been trying to re react against that in a way mm. and to find, find the value in things that seem to undermine value. Yes. Uh, but, but not to get rid of the idea of value. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's the, the things that make something valuable are the things of which undermine its value, maybe, yeah. in some way. And maybe that's not a value in terms of economic value, but that's a, purely a value in terms of a uh, an emotional or societal or social value, isn't it? It has something more as a condition to society than it does necessarily to... I mean, like, I was thinking about it in terms of when you're mentioning about the headlessness of Hirschhorn and then Jacot's stuff around ignorant schoolmaster within that book by Roncier, was it 1992? I think that, that book came out. Um, but that idea of ignorance, but the willingness to care for an individual in ignorance, I think is so important in that, you know, the ignorance of maybe not knowing the language of which you are teaching in, mm -hmm. to the same way to the ignorance of maybe not really understanding the theoretical underpinnings of your work, like Hirschhorn's ideas of the, the anti-monuments and all of the difficulties in that. But those contradictions are able to be superseded by the sheer empathy that the artist is trying to put forward towards the importance of care mm -hmm. of the individual and what they're 
trying to do with the work without not necessarily knowing how to square that circle of all of the other ideas around it you know they they say ignorance is bliss but maybe it's not bliss maybe it's more to do with ignorance is there's not enough time in the world to understand enough to actually do it in the way that yeah. would be seen to be correct or of value or rigorous you could yeah. say but i think i think that's i think your analogy of the anti monuments is a really interesting way of understanding Hershorn's work in that book and it, i think it applies more to this last chapter than I'd initially thought until this moment of trying to actually think, okay, how do I read this chapter with the with my students or in general um, in a moment where I'm going to be having to read it on my own, in my own house, on Skype or on Teams or Zoom or whatever of those bizarre platforms I have to teach on to do a seminar rather than in a room where we would go through what each word means meticulously or, you know, it's a completely different environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't really know where I was going with that. Other than <laughs> I think that your analysis is really interesting, and I really, I think I now value more your idea of value through the things that are of no value. <laughs> I think that if that makes any sense, it's a really, really poetic way of putting it. Yeah, to me that's somehow almost. Uh almost the beginning of the idea of art is uh, uh, you know it's like an icon mm. becomes a painting when they say oh it doesn't need to be made out of gold anymore yeah. you know the, the the gleam of the beyond that we're going to give through this comes through this a material that is not in itself value, you know, mm. costly and valuable and in itself admired. Mm, definitely. And maybe that's, I mean, how would you approach that from, you know, from your experience of curating exhibitions was the, the last show you did, it was it the white cube in Bermondsey, wasn't it? Was well, uh, I did a show actually, show. um, last late last year, a very small mm. show at a gallery called, uh, Holdsworth gallery in London. Mm. Uh, which was called um, Dark Laughter. It was a show for artists from New York. So that's mm. the most recent one that I've done. How how do you think you would have approached that show if you weren't able to have the gallery space? How would it? How would you have imagined it? Would you have reimagined the exhibition online, or would it have been more about actually writing about each of the individual works, or would it have been about not showing the? Could the work and the exhibition exist? digitally in this current situation or and what tactics would you do to to make that possible i don't know i think uh it wouldn't be about writing uh mm. about them because that's been a kind of uh mainstay of my thinking about mm. curating for myself which is that uh you know i write so much and when i curate an exhibition, uh, I don't want it to be a kind of illustration of something I could have written. Yeah. I really want it to be something that can only have existed in that form and in the relationship among things in a space. Yeah. And so, um, uh, so no, uh, I don't think for me personally, it would, could be through the internet because uh first of all uh you know that's not how i like looking at things anyway yeah. <laughs> uh, and so would and we have to wrap you can't uh you i don't i don't maybe it can be done but i don't know how to do it to make relationships between things be noticed spontaneously mm. through that medium. Whereas putting them in a space and having certain sight lines uh, that make you notice aspects of work that you wouldn't have as easily noticed if it hadn't been, you know, in your view with some other work and so on. Uh, that's something I think I know how to do in a yeah. dimensional space. 
there's something about being physically in the space that's actually incredibly important within with not just within arts making but arts viewing isn't it you know the the role of the curator is the you know at some point to deliver work to a public mm-hmm. and that important of you know what you're highlighting there in terms of sight lines I don't think you could experience on a website mm-hmm. in any way maybe maybe the best way to do it is that we pack up the work and we post it round to every single person's house mm. and we install it into their house with an instructions as if it was like an that IKEA would, flat pack that would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's what we we need to do is rather than think of the value of the singular item mm-hmm. you know we apply the idea of mass production and we post everyone the exhibition that they can install and we can have a, a, a Skype opening night. <laughs> Everyone's in their own personal version of yeah. the exhibition. Or maybe everyone should contribute uh, a work that mm. uh, each participant can physically realize themselves in their own space. And then everybody yes. has to make everybody else's work and put them up in their space or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. So you would you would give me suggestions of how this work could be made, and we'd all be making replicas or of each other's. or a mm. recipe, formula, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a bit yeah, it's a bit Gustav Metzger, and I quite like it. I like the way that when when Metzger went on strike, uh, no one else followed, but the importance that he still maintained his strike was really important. I know. And I think maybe that would be maybe that's the way to go, isn't it? As, as artists, is that we should maybe take some of his ideas of of making and and doing mm-hmm. and apply that into our own ways of doing it in our own homes. I think that's a really, is there anything else you would like to add in response to the text that you think that would be really important to, to understand or, or you felt from re looking at the work yourself? Uh, not, not that immediately comes to mind. I think we've kind of gone through the things that most struck me. Brilliant. Well, I think this is a really great place to, to wrap it up. And uh, I want to thank you, for your time Barry thank you so oh, much thanks a lot Paul and I hope it's of some use brilliant that's great thank okay. you okay